It's uh, 4 p.m. here at DBS Asia Central. Just a couple of days to go before the Lunar New Year holiday begins in this part of the world. Uh, we welcome you to our February Macro Insights live stream entitled Mutations and Valuations. Now, why are we only going to focus on mutations and valuations when so many things happened in the course of the past one month? And as we speak, we even have political developments, including impeachment hearing of Donald Trump at US Congress to a variety of political dimensions materializing from the Middle East to China. Well, it seems to me that regardless of you know, what the current narrative worldwide is, it is really these two factors. Uh, what's happening with the COVID-19 disease, with the various mutations, and what is happening to markets as far as valuations are concerned. To me, these are the two major determinants of global macroeconomic developments for the six to nine months ahead of us. So we'll focus on that. That doesn't mean that we're not going to touch on issues related to day-to-day -day macroeconomics, and we will have a whole section around yield curve steepening in today's presentation as well. But the main focus, as far as I'm concerned, is to think about what's going to be the state of play with respect to the virus this year, and what's going to be the state of play with respect to very stretched valuations in the market. So let's get right down to the presentation. Um, as I said earlier, the main title, Mutations and Valuations. Uh, we will begin by sort of thinking through the outline of the presentation, vaccinations and mutations. I want to sort of share with you a bit of a primer on uh, issues related to mutations, variations, and so on. Uh, it's kind of important for us to think through those things for what lies ahead, uh, because you know, till we really beat the virus down, there really is no winning uh, the, the, the effort to normalize our global economic uh, momentum. Uh, and then, yes, the thing that is closest to my heart, market valuations, and then we will follow on with some discussion on the growth outlook and this big issue that, that, in our view, requires quite a bit of attention is this ongoing steepening of yield curves around the world. And then we will end by looking at maybe about half a dozen or so questions from you that you have submitted ahead of time. So let's get right down to it, vaccinations and mutations. So these are our uh, boilerplate charts uh, with the stock of confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19 on the horizontal axis and the flow of cases on a five-day aggregate basis on the vertical axis. Whenever you see the charts, uh, various lines beginning to droop a little bit, that's what tells you that the latest incidence of uh, COVID-19 infection is somewhat easing. And that's what we see in the case of the US, which is now heading toward 20 million confirmed cases. But at the same time, on a daily basis, we are no longer in the 200, 300,000 cases, um, which then was adding up to like a million cases on a five-day basis, which is a representation in this chart. We are seeing some ebbing of that. Uh, we've seen uh, some ebbing elsewhere as well. Uh, think about the dark blue line represented by Russia or a few other cases like Italy uh, and perhaps even to some extent Brazil where things are not as alarmingly bad as they were a few months ago, uh, especially as we sort of went past the million confirmed marker in some of those countries. Uh, the journey from million to 10 million has been a little slower, hopeful, thankfully, for many cases. But nevertheless, you know, we have seen a second wave uh, in large parts of the world, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, and winter months are unkind to coronavirus type diseases, and which is why a vaccination related development notwithstanding, some of these uh, jumps in infection rates, uh, even on the margin if they're ebbing, still large numbers, uh, would lead to higher numbers of death, unfortunately, uh, for months to come. That's just the way uh, the, the, the brutal arithmetic of COVID-19 uh, evolves. Um, same sort of framework of looking at the outbreak, but this time for the key countries in Asia, and here you can see uh, the pronounced decline in the number of flow of cases in India. Um, and, and that's good news because India was at, po at one point on track to overtake the US as the country with the most number of infections. Uh, and although in the case of India, deaths have been far, far more muted than any of their counterpart figures in the Western Hemisphere, still uh, you do not want the disease to rage on and on and on. And it seems like um, uh, by virtue of good discipline as well as a good stroke of luck because it seems like 
the really contagious variants of the COVID-19 uh, or the SARS-CoV-2 virus has not been spreading through India. And now we're beginning to see some degree of relaxation of the numbers. I think most importantly in the case of India, regardless of what one's view is on the numbers and the extent of testing, is the clear fact that the hospitals are not overwhelmed. That would be something that would be independent of whether one believes in the numbers or not. Uh, the fact that the hospitals are not overwhelmed is a very good piece of news. But it's not all good everywhere in Asia. The blue dotted line is Indonesia. As you can see, there isn't much sign of respite there. Uh, the daily cases, the numbers remain uh, very large, and, and the stock of cases uh, have gone past a million and keep climbing. Uh, we have seen, in the case of the Philippines, some ebbing, uh, but you know, not as fast uh, pace as we have seen in the case of India. And given how small Philippines is relative to India population-wise, its numbers are, are remarkably large. Um, and then you have a couple of cases where the numbers, stock-wise, are not big at all, but have uh, been troubled by resurgence of the virus here and there. So countries that have had very good track record, Hong Kong, South Korea, uh, you know, you don't think of these countries as being troubled by this COVID-19 outbreak, but we've had renewed lockdowns and restrictions to mobility in those countries as virus cases have risen. Again, by global standards, those numbers are not large, but by their own very admirable, extremely low rates of incidence, let's say three, four months ago, uh, there has been a bit of a return, and then there are concerns about the uh, more infectious variants entering those countries, and hence we are seeing uh, efforts to uh, sort of tighten mobility to some extent. Then you have the case of Thailand, a country unfortunately just can't catch a break. Uh, we saw initially Thailand being touted as a very successful case of coronavirus control, uh, but since then, uh, the last few months have been tough for Thailand. We've seen a fairly rapid rise. Again, we're only talking about a few hundred cases a day, but a country that is desperate to open up its tourism sector that relies heavily on uh, tourism and large scale uh, gatherings uh, through various uh, you know, service sector means uh, have not been able to relax the lockdown measures because of this um, uh, incidence that has been steady and showing no release any sign of respite in that case. Uh, then you have the really impressive cases. Uh, one would be our own backyard, Singapore, where although we do see a steady drip of imported cases, meaning people arriving in Singapore and testing positive, uh, but as far as local transmission is concerned, uh, we're talking about daily incidents between zero and one or two. Uh, and let's hope that the various variants that are beginning to trouble authorities around the world do not find their way into the community in Singapore. But so far, so good, but we keep our fingers crossed. Um, uh, and of course, you know, we know that vaccination has begun and we'll take a look at those numbers momentarily. Now, as I said earlier, as you have infections, you will have deaths. It's almost you know, one to one uh, in, in some ways uh, that you know, not one infection per death, but if you have some infections, it will lead to some deaths. Uh, so let's look at the death statistic around the world, especially in the countries that are particularly hard hit. So this will tell you that January has been a really bad month for a variety of countries. UK, 486 deaths per million in the month of January of 2021, far worse than what we saw in April, May last year. So all the learnings about social distancing, all the treatments that we have with plasmas and antibodies and various uh, antiviral medications that are available, all, despite all that knowledge and all the practices, UK actually saw worsening uh, in terms of outcome in the month of January than it did uh, back in the worst of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, I mean, and it's not just the UK. Uh, you see here the red line, which is the US, at 294 per million. It's the worst that we have seen in this pandemic for the month of January. Same thing with Germany. Uh, same thing with, well, Sweden, almost more or less the same as uh, April. Uh, and then there is the story of France, where again, the numbers have been fairly elevated the last few months. Uh, I think there is some hope that for the month of February, the numbers will be a bit lower than what we have here. Uh, a, because as we said earlier, the incidence of the disease seem to be ebbing to some extent. Uh, we'll have to wait a little longer for the month of February numbers to become more crystal clear. Uh, but the first few months at least, uh, first few weeks uh, of data suggest that maybe uh, we will see a dip in the incidence uh, of death in, in a lot of these countries that have really been badly hit by the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, okay, now this is the usual set of slides. How many deaths? What's the infection uh, spread? But now, 
as we are vaccinating the world, we need to look at different kinds of visualizations. So look at this spider chart, where I picked a bunch of countries uh, that are not necessarily peers, but rather have somewhat varying track record with respect to vaccination, uh, and, and, and they sort of tell you, you know, how things are going around the world. So we start with Israel, a country in terms of population, not that much bigger than Singapore, but has had tremendous uh, progress in the last six weeks or so in terms of vaccinating its population. So through February 9, 62% Israelis have been uh, given at least one dose of the vaccine, uh, in some cases, you know, uh, second dose as well. Uh, and already we're beginning to see a uh, very encouraging outcome from Israel in terms of infection rates, in terms of death. So this is very good news that if you vaccinate a sizable number of your population, as the scientists have been telling us for a long, long time, it will lead to a decline in uh, spread of the disease. So as countries sort of head toward in that direction of Israel, we should expect similar outturns everywhere. UK is not doing bad either, as you can see. Oh, close to 20% of British citizens have also received the vaccine. And the US, which is much bigger population-wise, is also, I think, uh, last count is about 42 million doses have been administered to Americans uh, through February 9, and that's about 13% of the population. Some, of course, have gotten two doses, but mostly a single dose so far. Uh, we have Asian countries sort of lagging. China, just 2.2%, Singapore, 3.2%. But I think the sense of urgency in China and Singapore are, is this, I mean, it's probably not as acute because these countries are not dealing with a raging pandemic uh, with uh, deep lockdowns. And these countries are largely uh, in control of the disease. And hence, the need to sort of you know, vaccinate everybody as quickly as possible, I think, is a little less. Uh, they are taking their time in procuring the vaccine and coming up with protocols to administer it to first the first responders, then the elderly, and then the general population. I'm sure that by the time I come back to you in the March live stream, those numbers for China and Singapore will be substantially higher than where they are now. I do worry a bit about countries like India and Indonesia, where although the infection rates have been falling a tad, uh, but the sort of a beneficial outcome from vaccination that we have seen in countries like Israel uh, is you know, many, many months away from arriving in countries like that. Okay, so now with this vaccination context in place, let's also uh, take stock of all these little curveballs that are coming out of this pandemic, meaning mutations. So first of all, a little bit of uh, immunology 101. Uh, I've been learning about these things and I wanna share you, with you my learnings as well. So what's a mutation, what's a variant, and what are strains, and then there's a whole sort of literature on lineage of uh, viruses, uh, all that sort of stuff. So the basic things that we need to keep in mind is that every time one gets infected by a coronavirus, uh, the job of the virus is to attack healthy cells in your body, and then the body then gets infected with those, uh, or the cells get infected with that virus, it starts then reproducing, and as it sort of starts reproducing by copying the DNA of the virus, that copying sometimes is not perfect, it starts making mistakes, and those errors are basically what is known as mutation. Most of the time, these mutations lead to the virus basically becoming absolutely useless and losing it all its potency, sometimes because, you know, just the very nature of the way the DNA structure is, some of those mutations, some of those copying errors will lead to actually more lethal, more infectious uh, virus uh, outcomes. Uh, and, and that's the sort of, you know, thing that we have to look out for. Mutations are inevitable as a disease spreads, but deadly mutations are rare. But sometimes, especially in a global pandemic like this, it will happen. Once you have a virus infecting hundreds of millions of people, it's almost bound to be the case. So then there's a nation, notion of variance, that you know, within the mutations of the virus, there will be some that will have the same inherited set of mutations. And once those inherited mutations are there, those variants uh, might have within them you know, some degree of uh, uh, variation themselves. Uh, but uh, what we have to basically keep in mind is the lineage of these variants and uh, where they're coming from. So the things that are concerning uh, people around the world, uh, medical professionals, uh, governments, and so on, is this, uh, the, I basically have listed the three that are sort of sources of headache right now. One is known as the B117, emerged in the UK sometime in November of last year. The reason why we're worried about this is because it's very infectious, um, about 50% more infectious than the common strain, so it can you know, very rapidly spread through the population if people are not practicing social distancing and mask wearing uh, you know, behavior. Uh, and it's also, at least right now, uh, quite a bit more deadly. Now, typically, a very infectious 
uh, virus cannot be very, very deadly because it is affecting lots of people and if it sort of kills them, it doesn't really uh, spread much further. But in this case, you know, it's still an early going and it can be a mixture of those two lethal combination, very infectious and more de deadly. And most troubling, we're seeing this B117 now spreading quite fast in the US. And it's, it's doubling every 10 days right now. Uh, so let's keep our fingers crossed that it doesn't become one of those things that uh, outruns the uh, vaccination, which of course is also expanding very, very rapidly in the US. So it's, a, uh, it's quite the you know, race right now. Will, will the B117 overwhelm the population or will the fast rate of vaccination that's happening in the US, uh, which has really picked up pace in the last few weeks, uh, will that take care of this B117 spread? Then we have this B1351 uh, emerged in South Africa, again, late last year. Uh, very troublesome to the extent that uh, people are sort of already saying that, you know, some of the vaccines, I mean, there were some stories uh, earlier this week that uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is not effective against B1351. But then in the last 24 hours or so, we have seen uh, WHO come out and saying, you know, hold your horses, don't get too excited. Uh, there's a lot of studying being done. It's not that bad. And by and large, uh, especially the mRNA type vaccines that are being developed, uh, especially by Moderna and BioNTech Pfizer, they can come up with solutions to these things through booster shots. Uh, and, and even if the booster shots are not sufficient, they have the technology to come up with uh, vaccines around these mutations, even if they're very potent uh, in a matter of days. And then it will not take them like nine months to get approval the way they did for the first range because their technology is now proven, their efficacy is now well accepted, uh, and they will be able to come up with uh, products uh, much faster than even last year, if indeed uh, it is necessary to come up with that. Uh, I'm also reading about this um, idea that you might have to develop a multidimensional vaccine down the road, which takes into account several of these uh, mutations and variants and, and inoculates us against all of those. Uh, so don't get too worried. Scientists are really on top of this and we really have amazing technology to deal with these issues. Finally, there is this uh, P1 uh, uh, variant uh, originated in Brazil, a similar mutation as the B1351. Uh, again, we have to keep an eye on which way they spread uh, as travel sort of you know, starts to normalize. You know, it's not like you know, Brazil and South Africa have put a lid on the disease. Uh, this is the key issue for me, that as vaccination spreads, uh, people's confidence in travel will rise. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the risk of coronavirus will ebb because as people sort of travel around the world, they will go to areas where vaccination is not as widespread as their own home country and things will be raging in th those parts of the world. So the risk of picking up an infection there and bringing back to your country uh, a, a more uh, lethal mutation is, is a very big risk. So with that in mind, let's um, uh, take a look at the path ahead. Uh, so I already talked about the mutation and variance angle. Uh, this is potential a, uh, yeah, a spoiler, but to me a spoiler only to the extent that it will delay normalization of mobility, not like it would completely upend the fight against coronavirus and take us back to where we were in April, March last year. That is just not going to happen. We just know way too much more. Uh, we have uh, you know, the know-how, uh, both with respect to vaccination and antivirals, and typical uh, treatment protocols for people who are affected. So we will uh, most likely have seen the worst of death in this uh, month of January 2021. After that, it will surely go down as uh, vaccination uh, becomes widespread. But vaccination is a huge task. Uh, 42 million doses administered in the US is impressive, but think about the fact that the country has 300 million people. If we're talking about double dose vaccination, that's 600 million doses. So we're, you know, again, scratching the surface, 90% work left. And that is one of the countries that is way ahead of the game. Think about a country like India or Indonesia, uh, we're not even 99%, uh, basically, you know, we're not even 1% done, 99% of the work is left. So can the big pharma companies of the world keep up with the demand? with their production and not run into uh, production glitches and not have issues related to logistics of transportation and distribution. Those are the very big questions. As you can see, even a country like Singapore, very wealthy, very well ahead of the curve in terms of understanding the need for vaccination. Still, in the month of February now, we're talking about only a couple of percent of the population getting vaccinated. Surely some of the reason is the supply chain, availability, delivery, and so on, and local approval procedures. So as you can see, even if a country like Singapore is relatively slow, compared to say in Israel, 
or UAE, uh, what does it mean for the countries that have far less uh, advancement with respect to distribution network, ability to secure contracts, make payments, and so on. So I think 2021 will be a very challenging year where WHO, a large governments of the world, uh, struggle to make sure that the world is vaccinated in a fairly equitable manner. And the equitable part is very critical. You have to have large swaths of the world's population vaccinated. One country getting 100% vaccination means very little if the rest of the world is at 10%, because people will travel back and forth, the disease will spread. It spread in the Middle Ages when we didn't have aviation, we didn't have cars, and still it spread across borders. Today, it will certainly spread if we don't get vaccination done in a widespread basis around the world. So that is a very big challenge, and that's where I think a lot of energy uh, will be uh, devoted. Uh, I sort of welcome the COVAX initiative, which is focusing on affordability and availability for the developing world. Uh, and I think this is not some sort of a magnanimous move by the wealthy countries in the world and WHO. This is an absolute necessity. I remember uh, Raghuram Rajan uh, way back in April last year telling me in my podcast that unless you have defeated the virus everywhere, you have not really defeated it anywhere. And I think those were very prescient words and are absolutely relevant in the context of um, today. Third issue is the efficacy duration. This vaccine is great, and it certainly will lead to a decline in spread of the disease in the uh, fatality rates, no doubt about it. But for how long? Is the vaccine giving us six months of uh, Immunity, is it giving us less than that? If it is giving us more than that? If we have to get vaccinated every six months on a double dose basis, we can easily think of people beginning to get tired of that very, very quickly. So the effect of the first wave of vaccination through the course of 2021 better give us very good results, which then reinforces the need for taking the second vaccine and keeping things under control, at least in the enlightened, well-educated, uh, well-intentioned part of the world. Uh, short of that, uh, we might actually see some slippages against coronavirus by the time fall of 2021 comes. Because by then, everybody who has taken the vaccine now may well have to get ready for a second dose. Uh, and again, issue of supply chain, distribution, cost of this, who's going to pay? Uh, do we have the uh, infrastructure in place for, again, uh, efficacious uh, distribution? All of those things will come in. Now, it may very well be, and that takes me to my fourth point, is that COVID becomes endemic, meaning it doesn't get defeated. It becomes persistently present, but it's manageable. We have vaccines, we have antivirals, we know how to treat people. All that stuff is there. It's not as deadly as it were a year ago or has been the last month or so, but it is around. Meaning just like for yellow fever, you'll have to take a shot before you travel to certain parts of Africa or for people who are in the risk category, uh, flu vaccine is absolutely critical as winter sets in in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that sort of practice may well have to become routine, um, and, and, and therefore uh, we probably are not going to be out of the woods any time in 2021 with respect to COVID, perhaps not even in 2022. Look at the little news uh, sort of screenshot that I have on the right-hand side. This is not something from a long time ago. This is from just last week, that Canada has basically said no cruise ships through spring of 2022. Uh, this, in my view, is a harbinger for things to come. Uh, vaccination is not going to lead to a massive change in our behavior and travels anytime soon. Um, I think countries that are large, where there's a lot of vaccination, will probably display China-like attributes, which is within the country, people will travel a lot more, people will step outdoors, hopefully will still be maintaining some degree of uh, safe practices, but at the same time, they will have to not be fully normalized because if they do, they're again taking chances. All right, enough about uh, mutations and variants and so on. This is not a subject that we're gonna stop talking about for many, many months or maybe even a couple of years or so. All right, second issue, valuations. Now, we are seeing all sorts of things going on. Um, just consider the sort of news flow in the last three weeks or so. We had this astonishing pickup in market volatility in the US uh, around the GameStop uh, uh, you know, phenomenon where there was a classic short squeeze by a group of retail investors who were incidentally also supported by institutional investors against a group of institutional investors who were short that stock and that short squeeze led to 
um, many, many fold increase in the sp uh, stock price of GameStop and then spread to a whole bunch of other stocks. Again, stocks that have been completely out of favor, have a very little fundamentals to speak of, but at the same time, uh, the short squeeze led to astronomical increase in their prices. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of discussion about sort of gamification of trading that, you know, in the Reddit world, there are subreddit pages where people are discussing how to trade almost on a real time basis. And then they're posting screenshots of how much money they're making or losing. And this is becoming, you know, viral. And you have basically, you know, YouTube stars who are trading and making money and everybody else is getting energized. I personally here in Singapore, have encountered several teenagers in the last week or so who have told me that they are also uh, you know, trading on a, on a high frequency basis with all these US stocks and following things on Twitch and uh, Reddit pages and on YouTube and so on. So this is something that you know, we've never really experienced before. This is basically a convergence of social media and enthusiasm about trading and some sort of a political statement of you know, sort of ganging up of the masses against institutional investors, although I do think that that narrative is slightly overplayed because institutional investors are actually playing on both sides of that trade. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we have seen exceptional increase and decrease in volatility just in the course of last two weeks, stuff that you, know, you normally associate with very major macro events, very major decline in the markets, but actually none of those things that really happened, uh, but uh, you had these you know, bottom-up uh, developments causing very, very dramatic developments in the U.S. markets. Uh, you, I don't think that sort of phenomenon is over. Uh, it could lead to you know, more uh, you know, dramatic headlines with some stocks either increasing or decreasing in value in a very dramatic manner. It could lead to, again, these uh, extremely low-cost trading platforms to face some issues. It could lead to some other disruption in the market as market struggles to clear when certain stocks get very high volume transaction demand. Uh, so all those things, in my view, are not very healthy. Uh, they're not necessarily showing any sort of euphoria around certain technology or certain uh, development. They're basically showing you, again, that uh, the whole notion of retail trading has become a bit gamified. I'm not really sure if there's much social good out of that, other than the fact that you, know, you could say that the zero commission trading has brought a group of uh, previously disenfranchised uh, investors to the trading floor. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, but does that necessarily make the financial system better? Does it make it more equitable? I have my doubts. Stock market trading is still as a very, very niche, narrow phenomenon. Most part of the population are not part of this. Then this, uh, there's this notion of SPACs. I welcome you to listen to a podcast that I did a couple of weeks ago with Alok Oberoi, uh, an industry uh, veteran, all these uh, special purpose acquisition companies. Um, you know, I didn't really think of SPACs till late last year, and now I realize that this is like one of the biggest game changers in capital markets. Uh, it's just happening primarily in the US, but the wave of SPAC fundraising is about to hit Asia, I have no doubt in my mind. So what are SPACs? They're these uh, shell companies that investors set up. Um, they are uh, capable of um, raising money without necessarily having a company that is trading, uh, but at the same time, um, they are uh, a vehicle for investors to raise money and for early investors to get into companies that are not yet public. So what we see in the case of SPACs is that you raise a SPAC, raise some money, uh, and then you go out and find a company that you want to merge with, and then that company then starts trading on the stock market. And the major idea is that many companies which have to go through six, seven years of incubation and uh, due diligence before they can actually go uh, for an IPO, they can actually do this thing in a much shorter time horizon and come up with upsides for investors and themselves as well. So it's interesting and uh, uh, kind of provocative. It's been around for a long time, but in the course of 2020, it really took off. My understanding is more than half of US IPO market activity was SPAC related last year. Something like 80 billion plus dollars were raised through SPACs last year. And this year to the month of January, three quarters of US IPO activity was again SPACs related. Uh, so very dramatic development. Things that were not part of day-to-day -day capital markets vocabulary are now the key driving factor of fundraising and IPO. Uh, I don't necessarily see any systemic risk out of that, but again, uh, very dramatic, and, and again, it shows you the buoyancy in the market that you can raise tens of billions of dollars through these, uh, what is known as you know, blank check companies. Then, in the last few days, we have seen, again, you know, Bitcoin come back to the headlines in a big way. Uh, when I was you know, doing some research on Bitcoin, I realized that 
just uh, six weeks ago, the discussion was about Bitcoin going past $20,000. And as I speak right now, we're talking about $45,000, $46,000, perhaps even $47,000, with Elon Musk tweeting about how Tesla is now going to devote $1.5 billion of its cash to owning uh, Bitcoin. Uh, so whether it's Ether or Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, uh, interest, curiosity are you know, going through the roof. Uh, as uh, you know, loyal readers of DBS Group Research know that you know, we have a quarterly um, primer and updates on digital currency, both at the central bank level as well as the private level. We welcome you to read up and learn more about this phenomenon because it is certainly a phenomenon that is not going away uh, from uh, CFOs who think that you know, their treasury should have a chunk of their money in cryptos, uh, which is what companies like MicroStrategy and Tesla are saying to people who think that this is um, absolutely uh, zero value to society and again is reflecting buoyancy of the market and people's desire to get rich quick. Uh, truth probably rise somewhere in the middle, but uh, again, just like SPACs and gamification of trading, things that were not relevant for our day-to-day -day lives, I think that as investors who want to be aware of what's happening in the world, what's happening in cryptos are you know, sort of must read, must learn for everybody else. Then. The boring stuff, which is the valuation story. Now, clearly, we are living in a buoyant world. Uh, Case Shiller PE uh, P, uh, for, uh, I guess the latest number that I have is for the 5th of February, is at 35, higher than anything that we have seen uh, in recent memory. I suppose you would have to go all the way back to the dot-com boom days, 2000, 2001, or way back into the Great Depression uh, boom-bust, 1929, to see PE ratios comparable to where we are now. Now, the difference between now and those two episodes is, of course, that interest rates are exceptionally low, so you can't really make apples-to-apples -apples comparison. In fact, Robert Schiller, Nobel laureate economist who came up with the CAPE measure, himself has pointed out that the excess yield coming from U.S. stock market is still very attractive because real, real yield on bonds is basically you know, zero, and therefore the um, inverse of the PE, which is um, the equity market yield, it's still giving you 3.5% you know, excess return over bonds, which is not that bad. So the bottom line is, yes, markets are extremely expensive. Yes, in the long run, such expensive markets should not be able to give you very strong returns. But at the same time, does that mean that you know, we should sell stocks? No, because there is no other place for you to get um, any other returns. So you might as well stay long the market till some alternatives come up. But where will we get those alternatives? Um, now, as I have already pointed out, that even within the stock market, uh, we've seen some very exceptional rise in volatility. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the, the right corner of the chart, the red line, the spike in VIX volatility in, in the last few weeks was uh, comparable to uh, the time around complete panic of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but at that time, we had COVID-19 related panic. What was this? Again, gamification of trading and, and the GameStop phenomenon. Um, so this sort of pickup in volatility normally is associated with very large correction in asset prices, as you saw in 2020, but that was not the case this time. The market barely wobbled when all of that sell, uh, the spike in VIX was taking place. So where do we go? Do we go to credit markets? Well, look at this incredibly striking charts. Uh, U.S. corporate spreads are now as narrow or even narrower than they were before the pandemic. Um, we still have large swaths of businesses. We're characterized by uncertainty. Uh, we have a uh, you know, huge question mark about the durability and um, depth of the recovery, but the markets seem to be paying absolute top dollars, historically high valuation for uh, both corporate bond, high yield, or investment grade, as, uh, as if you know, things have all been taken care of and all the good stuff is ahead, all the bad stuff is behind. And is it just a question of the US markets? No. Look at the second panel. Uh, emerging market U.S. dollar spreads are now, again, lower than anything that we have seen uh, in, in recent memory, uh, basically at, at record highs in terms of valuation or record low in terms of tightness of spread. Um, so very buoyant markets on the credit side, very buoyant market on the equity side. Um, and, and if you think about uh, is there a sort of value in Asia vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., which was basically our call coming into 2021. That's still the case in our view, but of course, Asia is getting a lot of inflows and valuations in Asia are also beginning to pick up very sharply. Consider this chart. I borrowed it from my friends in the Institute of International Finance. Uh, they come up with this uh, monthly estimate of global portfolio flows and long before 
these numbers become available through the official channel, uh, uh, IIF uh, folks you know, try to uh, build up a whole uh, database around monthly flows. Uh, it basically tells you that emerging markets between November and January receive something in the range of $200 billion in capital inflow. So it is offsetting everything that left EM in uh, March, April during the height of the COVID panic. Uh, we have made up way more than that in terms of inflows in the last few months. Uh, where is the money going? I mean, it is very, very clear that the money is going largely to China. So the uh, uh, orange bar is debt flows, and Chinese fixed income markets have been you know, very, very popular among global investors. Uh, we have been very bullish uh, CBGs for a while. We still think they offer some degree of relative attractiveness, but of course, you know, they're getting also very, very rich. Uh, and uh, and uh, global investors can't get enough of them, and we are seeing you know tens of billions of dollars flowing into Chinese debt market. Chinese equity flows also have picked up, notwithstanding all the uncertainties that we saw last year with respect to the trade war and uh, you know investment restrictions and blacklisting by the U.S. I think market is basically saying that you know those things are behind us. The Trump era phenomenon, things will be far more uh, stable under Biden. By the way, I will talk a little bit about the Biden administration during the Q&A session. There's a good question there. I'm not going to discuss it right now. Um, but you know, XEM uh, uh, or EM X China equity flows and EM X China debt flows are also you know, not uh, negligible. Uh, we saw countries like uh, Indonesia uh, come to the markets in January and get outstanding uh, demand and uh, very good uh, uh, spreads and, and uh, coupon uh, on their uh, issuances, uh, some of the best that they've ever seen. So countries and corporates that are tapping the market right now are perhaps seeing the best ever uh, in terms of you know, investor demand and uh, uh, competitive pricing. Uh, so I, I remain concerned about the froth in the market. I also remain compelled to recognize the point that there aren't that many alternatives in this world of huge amount of cash and liquidity, and therefore the fraud that we see in the equity markets, the extremely high valuation that we see in the debt markets, particularly in credit, but also in sovereign space, I think it's just a matter of you know, inevitability. Uh, we have a recovery trade going on, we have a reflation trade going on, and there's a lot of liquidity sloshing around. Asset prices are bound to benefit from that. Unless, you know, as I was talking about earlier, the mutation and variant narrative comes to uh, spook investors in the coming months. Moving on, um, so a little bit of a discussion on the growth situation and how the first half of this year and the second half of this year uh, look like on a comparative basis. Now, of course, you know, we uh, think that um, maybe the recovery pace will, ge will be delayed a bit uh, with the sort of, you know, renewed mobility restrictions in some parts of you know, North Asia and some parts of Europe and maybe some parts of the US that you know, one hand you have the good story which is vaccination, on the other hand you still have this worrisome story that you know, uh, viruses are mutating and the variants could be more lethal and existing number of infection even if they're coming down on the margin are still very, very high. So maybe we are not going to see a major recovery in the first quarter but by second quarter, we'll see some of the normalization trade pan out in my view. And for the second half of the year, I'm sure, unless you know, there is going to be some very big setback on the vaccination side uh, and var variant side, uh, we will see a, a pretty strong recovery. Why so? Well, there are three factors here. One is particularly starting with the US, a very big stimulus is in the pipeline. Uh, Biden administration promised $1.9 billion worth of measures. Uh, once the horse trading is done in Congress, once some attempt at, um, is made in bipartisanship and some of the uh, really progressive measures are probably watered down a bit, it could still amount to a trillion, if not a little more. Uh, that's a sizable stimulus at a time when the economy is already on a recovery path. Uh, this could lead to a very strong rise in consumer sentiment and uh, retail sales. Uh, starting from spring, and but really getting traction in the summer months and spilling over to all of second half of 2021. Uh, and similarly, with respect to pandemic management, uh, if the Israel example, which is you know very fast uh, vaccination leads to a very fast decline in incidence of coronavirus infection, if that can be exported worldwide, we're really going to be in good shape for a massive takeoff in global travel and and trade and uh, you know, consumption of services in the second half of this year. Uh, fingers crossed, let's see. And the third issue is a financial stability issue. So I just shared with you some 
uh, factoids on the froth in the market. Uh, but if those things are there, but things don't go absolutely out of control, and the financial system remains relatively stable around ample liquidity and fairly decent balance sheet as far as the banking system is concerned, well then we might have a trifecta, stable financial system, successful pandemic management, and strong stimulus measures. That can take us to a very, very good second half of this year. Um, uh, but you know, sometimes all three things may not fire, uh, but still you know, fairly decent outlook for 2021. So how will the US look like in 2021? So, you know, 3.5% contraction for 2020 is certainly way better than what economists were expecting even as recently as August of last year. So we were forecasting minus 5, minus 6. Uh, then we were forecasting about minus 4. And then as the dust has settled, we are only at minus 3.5. Not bad at all for a country that had to uh, force itself to lock down in a rather draconian manner in uh, May, June, and did not really win the battle against COVID by any means in the second half of last year. But the cash transfer to the population, the paycheck protection, the uh, support to the companies, uh, the forbearance exercised by banks, all of that combined to really help the U.S. Uh, go through a contraction, but not necessarily resulting in massive bankruptcies, exceptionally high pickup in unemployment. In fact, what we've seen is that after a spike, unemployment numbers began to improve by August, September of last year, and the trend has more or less continued, although there is a little wobble here and there. So for 2021, we're talking about 4.5% growth uh, on the back of a very sharp rebound in um, public spending, a very uh, sharp pickup in investment, and also on consumption. Uh, the government part is understandable. We have additional stimulus in the pipeline as far as consumption and investment is concerned. Again, some of it will be helped by fiscal moves. Others will be supported by the fact that the vaccination trade, the um, uh, ample liquidity uh, phenomenon, low interest rate fueling, uh, home improvement uh, waves, uh, pr home purchase waves, uh, consumer durable purchases, and so on. So once confidence is restored in a meaningful manner and people start to think of their life post coronavirus, uh, you will see big time normalization of the growth trajectory in my view. So as you can see in the right hand side panel, I've sort of broken down the drivers of growth for next year, for this year. Uh, so sharp pickup in consumption, followed by investment, somewhat more muted in uh, uh, government spending, but you know, government spending is not a be all and end all. Although we are very optimistic about certain parts of the Biden agenda with respect to minimum wage, which could be very positive for consumption, and with respect to the green agenda, which could be very positive for the overall infrastructure environment, uh, investment environment. Moving on to uh, sort of a worldwide comparison of the growth path for 2021 and 2022, uh, taken from our friends at the IMF, uh, we are talking about the worldwide growth numbers going from minus 3.5 to 5.5. Not that much different from actually the U.S. trajectory. Uh, and then for advanced economies, it's more like from minus 5 to 4. And uh, for emerging market economies, from minus 2.5 to 6.3. Of course, in this case, emerging market is hugely driven by the China outcome in the case of you know, about 8% growth for 2021. And then for 2022, uh, some slowing, but still significantly above trend growth for these countries. Uh, that's a you know, powerful narrative and powerful picture. If this were to materialize, I think we're in very good shape, uh, particularly with respect to stress to uh, balance sheet of companies, because at some point last year, I think we here at DBS, as well as global regulators and economists worldwide, were very worried about massive bankruptcy risks around COVID-related shutdown. But if we're gonna see growth like this, the big debt accumulation, the um, uh, work stoppage, the uncertainty around uh, mobility, all those things would be over overwhelmed by these sort of growth. Because these sort of growth, as in you know, four to six percent growth in real terms, means close to 10 percent increase in nominal GDP, or maybe eight or nine percent increase in nominal GDP. That's really, really good. And it will help debt sustainability, it would help revenue growth, it would just feed into this what we call the reflation trade in a very big way. But let's also be clear that the dent from COVID-19 is massive. Uh, countries have had a big setback. What you're looking at now is the path of real GDP across a select number of countries. Uh, only China, you could argue that from 2018 to 2022, we'll see like a quarter 
or rather 25% increase in its real GDP, average about 6% growth despite the setback from 2020. But beyond that, everybody has lost a big, big step. So when you look at India or ASEAN, the trend that was there between 18 and 19, well, we're not getting back there anytime soon. India from 2018 to 2022 will have grown by only 14%. Uh, so over four years, you know, that's like a three and a half percent growth. Certainly not the aspirational rate for our Indian population or uh, uh, the authorities. And in the case of, you know, U.S., uh, again, when the dust settled in 06, despite all the nice things that I said about the growth numbers for 21-22, you can see that a big loss has been incurred and going back to trend will require going to 2023, if not beyond. And less said about the euro area in Japan, the better. They're basically were in a flat line and now they're in a shifting to a lower flat line. That's all I can say at this juncture. All right, yield curves. Um, we are keenly following what's happening at the inflation and uh, yield curves end. Uh, we don't think that this can create huge market dislocation, but we do think that it will lead to investors having to pivot to some extent and calibrate you know, where they stand with respect to market action. So for example, uh, inflation expectations out of the US, heading up to about two and a quarter, past that now 2.4%. Euro area, not quite comparable, but it's been picking up there as well. We have seen uh, gold beginning to perk up. We have seen industrial metals go up. Oil on a five-year basis is still not doing much, but certainly the trajectory of the last three, four months is upward. Uh, we are beginning to see some uh, materialization of um, uh, choke points, if you will, in the global supply chain which is causing some upward pressure in a variety of prices. Uh, so on the cyclical side, um, I think that you know, most of the drivers right now are pointing toward upward pressure on prices. Part shortage, chips and auto parts, uh, we're seeing some serious shortage around the world. Uh, industrial metal demand has picked up in China, so copper prices, as I just mentioned. US fiscal stimulus is certainly uh, inflationary. Uh, and then we are seeing some on the shipping side, shipping costs have gone up around, again, container ship availability, um, not necessarily keeping up with the demand for shipment around the world. So quite a few drivers of inflation. Uh, in the short run, therefore, I think there is a narrative that is, in my view, fairly compelling that we will see uh, reflation taking place, meaning you know, we had huge setback to the global economic outlook. We had deflationary expectation entrenching. All of that is being unwound. That's good and healthy. We don't need to be alarmed about a huge upside to inflation. We should just welcome this normalization and reflation narrative because Structurally speaking, for the medium term, we have actually major deflationary forces in play. Excess capacity, particularly in the energy sector, is massive. We have very poor demographic dynamic in China, Japan, EU, perhaps to some extent even in the US. And then technology looks like, you know, is a deflationary force. It keeps a lot of product prices you know, flat or declining over time. And then we have, on the wage side, not much bargaining power. So these things are long-term forces that conspire against big pickup in prices. I really don't see those things changing in a meaningful manner anytime soon. But in the near term, there are certainly uh, some markers for inflation, and the US curves are reflecting that. Look at the two year, 10 year, or 10 minus two year slope in the US. Now it's about 110 basis points, meaning long term rates have pick been picking up. The near end has been very much anchored by the Federal Reserve, but at the long end, things are picking up. 30 year Treasury, I think, has been also making fairly big moves. Uh, and the yield curve steepening uh, basically is now taking us back to the slope that we saw way back in 2017. By historical standards, these are not you know, sharp slopes, but in the last two, three years, standards certainly a meaningful normalization that we're seeing. My uh, final chart on uh, the issue of uh, rates is uh, you know, the spillover of what's happening in the US into the shores in here in Asia. So as you can see in Singapore, uh, rates have sold off as well. Uh, SORA and SOAR rates have been on the upward trend the last couple of months. Uh, curve in Singapore is much, much flatter than the curve in the US. Uh, our uh, fixed income strategist, Eugene Liao, sees value at the short end of the curve in Singapore, but not particularly compelling at the longer end. Uh, this issue of what's happened to yield curves is something that we will be coming back over and over again. All right, so we're done with the basic part of the presentation. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, let me take a look at some of the questions you have sent. Uh, many are very, very good questions, so thank you for that. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the first question. Uh, 
Can recent volatility in the U.S. equity market that was triggered by retail investors rallying against uh, institutional players be considered a one-off event? Well, short answer is no. I don't think you know it's a one-off event. You could see short squeeze like that come back over and over again across asset classes, not just in equities, because I think, again, as I said earlier, the gamification of trading, the power of all these uh, social media subedited groups, uh, and how people sort of you know swarm on certain position, that's not going to get un uh, undone. I don't think the regulators are that interested in uh, regulating such activity. At the end of the day, it's not front running. It's not inside information. So no law is being broken. If people are telling each other to go buy something, they have the right to do that. That's basically protected speech, if you will. Um, so as long as you know, there is no fraud, misinformation, I think these sort of hurting, swarming, if you will, on certain positions spread through social media, I think it's here to stay. Uh, how we deal with that and whether they become a source of systemic risk, we have to see. Uh, next question is related to um, the you know, retail investors. Again, is it now necessary for investors to model or factor their behavior of such retail investors? Well, I think that you need to worry about only these things if you are focusing on massively out of favor stocks that are not big cap stocks, because big cap stocks have very big players. And I really don't think that retail investors can create a massive short squeeze or can really fundamentally alter the behavior of really large cap stocks like say Apple, uh, which are traded by very large institutional investors and extremely savvy uh, quant funds. Uh, I really don't think you know, individual investors can be a match to those sort of activity. So if your own trading activity is around large cap stocks, ETFs and so on, I really don't think you need to be worried about uh, the sort of behavior of retail investors. But if you are, in the camp where you try to take contrarian views against what you think is the smart money, but you want to be even smarter, then of course I don't have to tell you that you should probably be reading these uh, Reddit groups and, and, and uh, trying to move with them. But I think that's very risky. That's putting massive amount of uh, uh, you know, speculation on simple position taking. And again, I think investment is for long term, in our view, People who want to do high frequency trading should be in the professional world, should take a job at a brokerage in my view, not necessarily do it out of the bedroom, but that's just you know, my personal view. Uh, some people may find purpose and, and satisfaction out of day trading, and that's been around also for a very long time. Technology certainly has made it much, much easier. All right, next question. Will negative rates in Sing dollar or US dollar take place in Southeast Asia? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that U.S. dollar rates are going to go into negative territory. The window for that was summer of 2020 when there was genuine deep fear of a protracted recession and uh, deep deflation in asset prices. <clears throat> I think the Fed, by injecting a huge amount of liquidity, by being very, very proactive with quantitative easing and zero rate policy, took care of those risks, so much so that we don't have to go below the zero bound. And as you can see with the recent steepening of the yield curve, that the worry is no longer about whether rates are going to go down to negative territory or not, but rather should we be expecting inflation down the road, which is the opposite of a negative rate phenomenon. It would certainly start putting pressure on the nominal rates to go up, both at the short and the long end. Short end held by, by the Fed and its uh, QB program. But now, if indeed we see strong second half of recovery in 2021, we see continued recovery above trend in 2022. Uh, discussion about taper will certainly come in to Fed vocabulary next year. And then in 2023, we might even talk about uh, policy normalization by liftoff. So far away uh, from reality of now, which is still worries about variations, still worries about um, how long companies that are out of favor can hold on in a world of lockdown and mobility restriction that we don't need to really discuss those things at depth. For 2021, I really don't think we need to worry about negative rates. Uh, and as far as the opposite of negative rate phenomenon, which is will there be a jump in to positive territory of rates? Again, at least 12 months before we get serious about those discussions in my view. Next one, and I, I have sort of told you, foretold you that I was gonna come to this. Any comments on the first 20 days of the Biden administration? Well, yes, um, it, Biden administration, by virtue of having control of the House and the Senate, is delivering everything that was promised and is undoing a lot of the things that are antithetical to this administration vis-a-vis -vis the previous administration. So when you think about in geopolitics, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trump administration in its waning days uh, declared the Houthi rebels as a terrorist organization. 
Biden administration has quickly undone that. Uh, Trump administration was very much, again, talks with the Iranians on uh, the, the uh, nuclear deal. Biden administration is getting back there. Uh, Trump administration had approved of very high-tech equipment sales to Saudi Arabia and its allies. Biden administration has put a hold to that. So that's geopolitics. Uh, then you have the issue of the f stimulus measure, you know, whether it is increase in minimum wage or a big ambitious green agenda, a huge amount of state aid, uh, large checks for uh, families with, um, you know, low, relatively low means. All those things are going to be delivered through uh, this fiscal package or the subsequent fiscal packages. Uh, the U.S. is back on, in the game as far as Global trade is concerned. Uh, the U.S. just uh, supported the nomination of the former uh, finance minister of Nigeria as the head of WTO. Uh, U.S. has already gone back to the Kyoto um, uh, climate uh, uh, treaty. So massive amount of changes already taking place. And if you see approval rating of the Biden administration, if you see the totality of all the actions that have been taking place, it's as expected and it is being treated favorably by day-to-day uh, -day Americans, uh, even though the country remains deeply divided among Republicans who favor Trump and those that don't. Um, of course, there's the sideshow going on, which is uh, uh, Trump uh, impeachment, uh, which will, I suppose, go ahead. Uh, but uh, of course, the Senate doesn't have, in my view, the votes, requisite votes to impeach President, uh, uh, former President Trump. So we will have a couple of weeks of this circus uh, starting from now. But I think a month from now, when I'm back doing this live stream, we'll probably have forgotten all about it. It would be something that was done to uh, hold some degree of accountability of what happened with the Capitol Hill uh, invasion by the uh, Trump supporters. But at the same time, it will not lead to Trump being banned from running from office or any other punitive measure like that. Next question is on the issue of uh, China-US uh, relationship. Have we seen a de-escalation? I suppose yes, uh, to some extent. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, China-US rivalry is not one of those things that was just a product of Tr President Trump's tweet. Uh, there are genuine areas of disagreement and contention in between China and the US on matters of human rights, on matters of trade and um, uh, technology. Uh, so don't expect Biden administration to become buddies with the Chinese, but do expect them to uh, conduct policy through multilateral uh, means, through rules-based, more stable means, as opposed to rather um, a volatile and, and aggressive and, and acrimonious manner and through tweets. That's not going to be the signature of this administration. So I think that there's certainly some degree of decrease in temperature. Uh, you can see companies like Huawei now coming up with lawsuits to challenge uh, U.S. government's uh, uh, various restrictions on operating in the U.S. Uh, I don't think the courts will necessarily change their tone uh, when they listen to these, but uh, clearly uh, they would not be goaded on by the administration to be out and out antagonistic to China in all areas. Uh, so expect, again, the Americans, the Europeans, the Aussies, Japanese, all to now form a club in issues related to tech transfer, technology transfer, intellectual property protection, and so on. You will see further um, energizing of the CPTPP. Whether the US comes back or not is a different question, but the idea that you know, multilateral framework is needed to improve China's behavior on, on these matters, I think is uh, going to be very much uh, part of the agenda as far as the Biden administration is concerned. Final question, uh, what is DBS's view on the timeline of the pandemic? So we basically are going back to where the presentation began. So I think that's kind of apropos for the last couple of minutes of this presentation. Well, the timeline is the following. Q1, Q2, the Western countries will make very strong progress in vaccination, or let's say developed markets. So Korea, Japan, Singapore will also be part of this dynamic, Australia perhaps as well. Uh, developing countries will not be part of this narrative. Uh, and, and then unfortunately, in the second half of this year, you will see a reflation normalization trade taking place among these developed markets, which will start again uh, traveling to each other's economies, uh, carrying out events, uh, but still maintaining significant amount of travel restriction of the citizens of the developing world where uh, progress with respect to vaccination is going to be limited. Uh, if you remember, or if you have, are a reader of DBS Research, our 2021 outlook is called a bifurcated world. My fear how, is that you know, in the coming months, the timeline of the pandemic uh, management would reflect that bifurcation in a very stark manner. 
countries that don't have the means, countries that don't have the infrastructure will be left behind by countries that will aggressively vaccinate their population and start uh, moving their population around and start normalizing their economies. But all of this is, of course, uh, shrouded by one uncertainty, which is these variations, these mutations. Can they spoil the party? Uh, right now, the market is not really pricing that in. If indeed we see severe challenges coming from mutations and variations, variants in the coming months, uh, expect markets to get very, very nervous. We're not quite there yet. We will choose to uh, be hopeful. We would choose to expect scientists and uh, medical professionals to deliver uh, even quicker solutions to the challenges of this pandemic than what we saw last year, which itself was an amazingly heroic effort. Uh, and based on that expectation and faith, I will say that the coming months would be gradual improvement in our battle against uh, the pandemic, uh, bifurcation and occasional stumbles notwithstanding. So I'll end the live stream right there. Uh, thank you very much for the couple of hundred of you who did uh, uh, join us for the last one hour or so, and thanks very much for your questions. We'll come back to you in March. Till then, stay healthy, and to those of you who celebrate, a very happy Lunar New Year.